to the outside world rumbled, and he could hear the panes clink against their frames. Gary Sinigi thought that he might be dead within the next hour, but the idea didn't trouble him. Whatever happened was meant to. And besides, he definitely wanted to go out with a bang, not a cowardly whimper. And why the hell not? He had plans for a long and exciting career after his death. Gary Sinigi was wearing a lightweight black jumpsuit with a red Nike logo. He carried three bulky bags. He figured that he looked just like another yuppified traveler at the crowded train station. He appeared to be overweight, and his hair was gray for the time being. He was actually five foot ten, but the lifts in his shoes got him up to six one today. He still had a trace of his former good looks. If somebody had wanted to guess his occupation, they might say, Teacher. <laughs> the cheap irony wasn't lost on him. He'd been a teacher once, one of the worst ever. He had been Mr. Sanigi, the Spider-Man. He had kidnapped two of his own students. He had already purchased his ticket for the Metro Liner, but he didn't head for his train just yet. Instead, Gary Sinigi crossed the main lobby, hurrying away from the waiting room. He took a stairway next to the center cafe and climbed to the balcony on the second floor, which looked out on the lobby about twenty feet below. He gazed down and watched the lonely people streaming across the cavernous lobby. Most of these assholes had no idea how undeservedly lucky they were this particular morning. They would be safely on board their little commuter trains by the time the light and sound show began in just a few minutes. What a beautiful, beautiful place this is, Sanichi thought. How many times he dreamed about this scene, this very scene at Union Station. The main hall before him held an information booth, a magnificent electronic train arrival and departure board, the center cafe, Sifuzzi, and America restaurants. The concourse led to a waiting area, which had once been called the largest room in the world. What a grand and historic venue he had chosen for today, his birthday. Gary Sinigi produced a small key from his pocket. He flipped it in the air and caught it. He opened a silver-gray metallic door, which led into a room on the balcony. He thought of it as his room. Finally, he had his own room, upstairs with everyone else. He closed the door behind him. Happy birthday, dear Gary. Happy birthday to you. This was going to be incredible, beyond anything he'd attempted so far. He could almost do this next part, blindfolded, working from memory. He'd done the drill so many times. In his imagination, in his dreams, he had been looking forward to this day for more than twenty years. He set up a folding aluminum tripod mount inside the small room and positioned a Browning BAR on it. The rifle was a dandy, with a mil-spec scoping device and an electronic trigger he had customized himself. Suniji knew everything about Union Station, and also about mass murders conducted in crowded public places. As a boy, he had obsessed on the so-called crimes of the century. He had imagined himself committing such acts and becoming feared and famous— he planned perfect murders, random ones. And then he began to carry them out. He buried his first victim on a relative's farm when he was fifteen. The body still hadn't been found, not to this day. He was Charles Starkweather. He was Bruno Hauptmann. He was Charlie Whitman. Except that he was much smarter than any of them, and he wasn't crazy like them. He had even invented a name for himself. Soniji. The name had seemed scary to him even at thirteen or fourteen. It still did. Starkweather, Hauptmann, Whitman, Sanigi. Sanigi sat on a metal folding chair and made himself as comfortable as he could. He pulled up a battleship gray tarp that blended into the background of the train terminal's dark walls. He snuggled under the tarp. He was going to disappear to be part of the scenery, to be a sniper in a very public place in Union Station. An old-fashioned-sounding train announcer was singing out the track and time for the next metro liner to Baltimore, Wilmington, Philadelphia, and New York's Penn Station. Sonichi smiled to himself. That was his getaway train. He had his ticket, and he still planned to be on it. No problem, just book it. He'd be on the metro liner or bust. Nobody could stop him now. Except maybe Alex Cross. 
And even that didn't matter anymore. His plan had contingencies for every possibility, even his own death. Then Suniji was lost in his thoughts. His memories were his cocoon. He had been nine years old when a student named Charles Whitman opened fire out of a tower at the University of Texas in Austin. Whitman was a former Marine, 25 years old. The outrageous, sensational event had galvanized him back then. He'd collected every single story on the shootings, long pieces from Time, Life, Newsweek, the New York Times. He still had the precious articles. They were at a friend's house being held for posterity. They were evidence of past, present, and future crime. Gary Sinigi knew he was a good marksman, not that he needed to be a crackerjack in this bustling crowd of targets. No shot he'd have to make in the train terminal would be over a hundred yards, and he was accurate to up to five hundred yards. Now I step out of my own nightmare and into the real world, he thought, as the moment crystallized. He peered through the Browning's telescope at the busy, nervous, milling crowd. He searched for the first victim. Life was so much more beautiful and interesting through a target scope. He scanned the lobby with its thousands of hurrying commuters and summer vacation travelers. Not one of them had a clue about his or her mortal condition at that very moment. No one ever seemed to believe that something horrible could actually happen to them. Suniji watched a lively brat pack of students in bright blue blazers and starched white shirts. They were giggling and running for their train with unnatural delight. He didn't like happy people at all, especially dumbass children who thought they had the world by the nuts. The target circle in his customized scope had a black sight post rather than the more common bullseye. He preferred the post. He watched a montage of shapes and motion and colors swim in and out of death's way. This small circle of the Grim Reaper was his world now, self-contained and mesmerizing. Suniji let the aiming post come to rest on the broad, wrinkled forehead of a weary-looking businesswoman in her early to mid-fifties. The woman was thin and nervous with haggard eyes, pale lips. Say good night, Gracie, he whispered softly. He almost pulled the trigger, almost started the morning's massacre. Then he eased off at the last possible instant. Not worthy of the first shot, he thought, chastising himself for impatience. Not nearly special enough. Just a passing fancy. Just another middle-class cow. The aiming post settled in and held as if by a magnet on the lower spine of a porter, pushing an uneven load of boxes and suitcases. The porter was a tall, good-looking black, much like Alex Cross, Suniji thought. His dark skin gleamed like mahogany furniture. That was the attraction of the target. He liked the image, but who would get the subtle special message other than himself? No. He had to think of others, too. This was a time to be selfless. He moved the aiming post again, the circle of death. There were an amazing number of commuters in blue suits and black wingtips, business sheep. A father and teenage son floated into the circle as if they had been put there by the hand of God. Gary Suniji inhaled. Then he slowly exhaled. It was his shooting ritual, the one he'd practiced for so many years. He had imagined doing this so many times, taking out a perfect stranger for no good reason. He gently, very gently, pulled the trigger toward the center of his eye. The shot made a loud cracking noise, and the sound seemed to follow the flight of the bullet down toward the lobby. The teenager's head exploded inside the telescopic circle. Beautiful. The head flew apart before his eyes. Then Gary Suniji pulled the trigger a second time. He murdered the father before he had a chance to grieve. Rush hour. 8.20 a.m. Jesus God Almighty, no. A madman was on the loose inside Union Station. Samson and I raced alongside the double lanes of stalled traffic which covered Massachusetts Avenue as far as the eye could see. Car and truck drivers honked their horns in frustration. Pedestrians were screaming, walking fast, or running away from the train station. Police squad cars were on the scene everywhere. Up ahead, on North Capitol, I could see the massive all-granite Union Station terminal, with its many additions and renovations. 
Samson and I flew past the new Thurgood Marshall Justice Building. We heard gunshots coming from the station. They sounded distant, muffled by the thick stone walls. It's a goddamn real, Samson said, as he ran at my side. He's here, no doubt about it. I knew he would be. An urgent call had come to my desk less than ten minutes earlier. I had picked up the phone, distracted by another message, a fax from Kyle Craig of the FBI. I was scanning Kyle's fax. He desperately needed help on his huge Mr. Smith case. He wanted me to meet an agent, Thomas Pierce. I couldn't help Kyle this time. I was thinking of getting the hell out of the murder business, not taking on any more cases, especially a serious bummer like Mr. Smith. I recognized the voice on the phone. It was Gary Sinigi. He told me he was calling from Union Station. He said he was just passing through D.C. and that he hoped against hope that I'd like to see him again. He told me to hurry if I didn't want to miss him. Then the phone went dead. Now Samson and I were sprinting along Massachusetts Avenue. We were moving a whole lot faster than the traffic. I had abandoned my car at the corner of 3rd Street. We both wore protective vests over our sports shirt. We were scooting as Sinigi advised me over the phone. What the hell's going on in there? Samson said through tightly gritted teeth. That son of a bitch has always been crazy. We were less than fifty yards from the terminal's glass and wood front doors. People continued to stream outside. He used to shoot guns as a boy, I told Samson. He used to kill pets in his neighborhood outside Princeton. He'd do sniper kills from the woods. Nobody ever solved it at the time. He told me about the sniping when I interviewed him at Lorton Prison. Called himself the Pet Assassin. He got himself trapped in there. Purposely trapped. Why the hell would he do that? Samson asked as we came up to the front doors. Worries me too, I said. Why had Garrison Eiji called me? Why would he effectively trap himself in Union Station? Samson and I slipped into the lobby of Union Station. The shooting from the balcony was from up high somewhere. We both went down flat on the floor. I kept my head low as my eyes scanned the huge and pretentious train station lobby. I saw three people already down, probably dead, on the lobby floor. My stomach dropped. One of the victims was a teenage boy in cut-off shorts and a Redskins practice jersey. The second victim appeared to be a young father. Neither of them was moving. Hundreds of travelers and terminal employees were trapped inside arcade shops and restaurants. The firing stopped. The temporary silence was maddening and spooky. There was supposed to be lots of noise here in the train terminal. Someone scraped a chair against the marble floor, and the screeching sound echoed loudly. I palmed my detective's badge at a uniformed patrolman who had barricaded himself behind an overturned cafe table. Sweat was pouring down a uniformed cop's face to the rolls of fat at his neck. Where's he firing from, I asked the uniform. Hard to tell, but he's up in there somewhere, that, that general area. He pointed to the south balcony which ran above the long line of doorways at the front of Union Station. Nobody was using the doors now. Sineji was in full control. Can't see him from down here, Samson snorted at my side. He might be moving around, changing position. That's how a good sniper would work it. Has he said anything? Made any announcements? Any demands? I asked the patrolman. Nothing. He just started shooting people like he was having target practice. Four Vic so far. Sucker can shoot. Suddenly, from up on the balcony above us, a rifle barked. The flat crack of the weapon echoed off the train station's thick walls. A woman screamed inside the America restaurant. I saw her go down hard as if she'd slipped on ice. Then there were lots of moans from inside the cafe. The firing stopped again. What the hell was he doing up there? Let's take him out before he goes off again, I whispered to Samson. Let's do it. Our legs pumping in unison, Samson and I climbed the dark marble stairway to the overhanging balcony. Uniformed officers and a couple of detectives were crouched in shooting positions up there. I saw a detective from the train station detail which is normally a small crimes unit. What do you know so far? I asked. I thought the detective's name was Vincent Mazio, but I wasn't sure. He was pushing 50, and this was supposed to be a soft detail for him. I vaguely remembered that Mazio was supposed to be a pretty good guy. He's inside one of those ante rooms. See that door over there? The space he secured has no roof cover. Maybe we can get him from above. What do you think? 
I glanced up toward the high copper ceiling. I remember that Union Station was supposed to be the largest covered colonnade in the 